Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a great occasion. It's a very wide canvas and uh, uh, there is already a lot of ideas and uh, uh, new thinking which is in place, but uh, I'll just take a few seconds to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Jaiswal and his wonderful initiative to, uh, to have this uh, International Studies Convention. I mean, never in past so many decades have we seen uh, just a few band of uh, very committed and very passionate people bringing about such transformative changes to the way we discuss academics. So thank you, Pramod. Thank you, all his colleagues, and uh, look forward to uh, uh, being together all the time, every time you do something. Now, very welcome to my um, uh, fellow panel panelist. Uh, as you know, without uh, much ado, the theme is before you, innovative trajectories to strengthen Nepal-India relations. Now, why have we talked about innovative trajectories uh, is also uh, because we belong to Banaras, Varanasi as you call it. Varanasi has very, has great relationship which in different forms it has changed. There were transferences of several types but people in Banaras, Banaras Hindu University has been interested in this. As you know, there, there is a Nepal study center. There is also this UNESCO chair for peace and Malvi center for peace research. And along with that, we have this center for peace and development. You can see a little banner at the backside. It's, although it's uh, almost a decade old or maybe more than that initiative, but now it's gaining grounds and we look forward to further collaboration with the institutions now, this particular panel is very interesting in terms of uh, the poise, the balance that we have tried to attain here. We have uh, some very senior people, senior, not in terms of knowledge, because young people can, can be brighter than they are, but very senior people and very younger people. I wouldn't call it junior is not a good term. We have specialists from all around different disciplines from uh, ranging from defense and strategic studies. We have issues ranging from geopolitics, security issues, to rethinking, revisiting the treaty, which is uh, 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 these days uh, really engaging the attention of so many of us. So wide range of issues. The only thing I would say as a chair is keeping in mind that we have already lost a good time. And in our peace and conflict studies, we say that, well, most of the times the conflict is about the scarcity. And uh, very rightly, there is so much uh, Dr. Jaiswal has put so many wonderful uh, panels around that it has it is bound to be the case. So scarcity is the cause of conflict, but there are ways in which uh, uh, we can uh, sort of sort it out and uh, look at the problem solving attitude. So in that spirit, I request all my fellow participants whom I'm going to invite to speak is to just uh, uh, evade the uh, banalities, things that we already know, and that's how you know we can really address the innovative, the emerging uh, aspects of uh, uh, the Indo-Nepal uh, uh, relationship. And the idea is, how do we strengthen it? How do we uh, get transcend the traditional barriers of understanding? Typical arguments why you know the security base. Sometimes we have to talk about non-traditional security issues. We have to talk about new thinking, we have to talk about new cultural factors, cultural understanding that might help. So my request to my panelists is be brief. And I could see from the earlier session that PowerPoint is not a great thing, whatever you call it, PowerPoint or slides. The power always makes me a little uneasy. But uh, even if uh, you have PowerPoints, try to imagine that they are already read. So just make your points very quickly. So in the list, uh, may I uh, uh, invite uh, Colonel DPK Pillai from uh, Manohar Parikkar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA as it was formerly known. He hardly needs introduction. He's a veteran in the true sense of the term. He has been uh, an old uh, the seminar, very old seminar participants and an in, in influencer, if I can say. And of course, he holds his own ground in security study. Colonel, are you around? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. 
uh, Colonel Pillai has just met with an accident and uh, he has a hand condition from one of the wars and he sent his apologies to all of us. So uh, we could, uh, I request uh, the chair to move on. To, right, to, so to uh, we, 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 we have our uh, prayers for a speedy recovery, Colonel Pillai's, but uh, then we go to uh, somebody around his own professional uh, area and that is uh, group captain R.K. Singh. He, uh, you may not uh, find his name, but he was our top uh, choice, but somehow one of those uh, uh, issues and he couldn't find, but he is, uh, uh, he has uh, been uh, uh, not only a doctorate in defense studies, and, uh, but uh, he has uh, served as the director and head of Amity Institute. And he all serves right now as uh, in Raksha, Rashtri Raksha University's and adjunct faculty. So uh, welcome, uh, 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 Captain uh, Rajesh Kumarji as first name, and look forward to really uh, sort of also substituting for Colonel Pillai and talk about the security perspective or whatever you have in mind. So very welcome, please. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, this kind introduction. Uh, again, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Uh, Jaiswal and Professor uh, Anju Sharan for giving me this kind of opportunity to express my views on Indo-Nepalese relationship with special focus on uh, military cooperation. And through that, the economic development, whatever is possible. So coming, uh, should I start the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, <laughs> So uh, to, to uh, remind the uh, large number of uh, participants and audience, uh, I would like to quote Field Marshal Sam Manikshaw on the, the Gurkha uh, valor. In his words, I quote and unquote, if anyone tells you he is never afraid, he is a liar or he is a Gurkha. So ladies and gentlemen, you can well appreciate uh, the, the valor in these uh, saying, how bold and courageous our Gurkha troops are, be it in Nepal or in India. Just to bring the, the battle cry, uh, Jai Mahakali, Ayo Gurkhali. The moment this war cry is heard, let me assure you, it brings down chill to the enemy front line. So keeping in this uniqueness of Gurkhas in the Indian Army, I will start my presentation with Jay Mahakali. A brief on uh, the, the historical linkages uh, between uh, India, Nepal, and the Gurkhali soldiers. Contrary to the popular belief that the British were the pioneers of introducing Gurkha soldiers to the world, uh, we must appreciate that it was Maharaja Ranjit Singh who initiated this particular aspect of uh, recruiting Nepalese uh, Gurkha soldiers in his army. And thereafter, the Britishers realized the importance and they, uh, they recruited good about 10 Gurkha regiments in their British Indian army. From there onwards, the, the legacy of Gurkha soldier is continuously moving on. Today in India, we have about uh, 30,000 Nepali Gurkhas serving who are the backbone of India's national security. This is a unique model of military diplomacy wherein a citizen of neighboring country participates in the military of its neighbor and takes a vow to secure the national territories. That's why I say Gurkha soldiers are one of the pillars of deep-rooted friendly relations between India and Nepal. They are the unbreakable bond. They are the strongest pillars of the Indian uh, India-Nepal uh, friendship, which I'll elaborate in my presentation. But just to remind that both states must reminisce Nepal-India relations friendship through the bravest of the brave and most generous of the generous, that is the Gurkha soldiers. Now, before I move on for the uh, audience and the participants who are not aware that it is only the Nepalese army uh, citizens who have the privilege to join voluntarily Indian army 
at both the cadres of Jawan as well as an officer. Colonel Lalit Rai was one such example who fought valiantly and led his troops in Kargil war, for which he was awarded bravery award by government of India. So today there are good about 39 battalions of Gurkha regiment, which is diverse in the entire length and breadth of the country. Another question arises, ki, do the Nepalese soldier, the Gurkha soldiers employed in Indian army are given the equal treatment? Yes, they are part and parcel of Indian army and they have any and everything, whatever is entitled for troops per se given to them, right from pay pension, as well as the benefits of ex-servicemen, medical treatment right at the doorstep in Nepal, wherever they are. The Indian Army runs phenomenal number of uh, welfare projects, which I'll come a bit later, but uh, quickly I'll move on. What, are, what is the present status of India-Nepal defense cooperation? India has been assisting Nepalese Army in its modernization program by supplying a lot of military equipments. Assisting in disasters, let me remind 2015, the mega earthquake which stuck and devastated Nepal, Indian Army and Armed Forces played a very major role, not only in disaster relief, supply management of medicine and food, but also in reconstruction part. Besides, we have regular joint military exercises of battalion level. There are a lot of joint adventure activities which are undertaken by troops from both the countries. Bilateral visits are there. Nepalese Army officers have the privilege to attend various courses in Indian training, Indian Army training institutions, which are War College, Defense Services, Staff College, and including the Abinishio training in Indian Military Academy. Another unique feature of our relationship is that right since 1950, India and Nepal have been awarding each other's army chief with the honorary general of the other country. Isn't it a unique feature wherein Nepalese chief of army staff is also a general of Indian army? Yes, it is. Thus, a Gorkha regiment of Indian army are raised and recruited from all, almost all the districts of uh, Nepal. And they are the volunteer force who participate for a lot of training in India, and then they serve the country. Keeping in view their services rendered, the government of India is obliged and feels its moral responsibility to support these ex-servicemen after they have rendered their service. Towards that, they have created a very, very elaborate arrangement right from the defense wing established under the ambassador of the Indian embassy in Nepal to pension paying officers to uh, district soldier boats in Nepal, almost in all the districts through which they run a lot of welfare programs. Since the time has come, so I'm uh, just rushing through and getting back to uh, the main crux that is how we can rejuvenate uh, the Indo-Nepalese relation through the contribution of Indian Army. As I mentioned, uh, the, the pensionary things, uh, besides that, uh, appreciate that approximately 1,27,000 pensioners are there, of which 90,000 are the Indian Army uh, personnel of Burka, of Nepalese origin. Their pay, pension, whatever is there, goes directly to the bank in Nepal. Besides, in the rural or far-flung areas, the Embassy and Defense Wing has uh, made payment camps, good about 36 of them, to cater for the needs of pension disbursement, right at the doorstep of the ex-servicemen. Uh, just to give you a fair idea as to what is the quantum of pension being given, it comes to something around uh, 4,800 crores of Nepalese rupees. Besides this, there are remittances from good about 32,000 serving Nepalese origin soldiers, which comes to about good 1,000 crore Indian rupees or 16,000 Nepalese rupees. Appreciate this, that this is 63% of the total foreign grant in aid received by the government of Nepal. 
to consolidate the, the welfare schemes and uh, integration of these ex-soldiers uh, of uh, Nepalese origin with the society where they live in Nepal, uh, India has gone ahead and created Nepal Bharatiya Gurkha Sainik Board. Now this organization is very instrumental in linking the last man ex-servicemen in the rural segment or wherever they are in Nepal with a whole lot of welfare schemes and training uh, which is required to make them capable and uh, ready for any kind of industry or small scale uh, work which these uh, retired Gorkha soldiers want to undertake, including the aid in grant. It is through them that Government of India executes various social welfare projects in Nepal. These exhibitions have shown exemplary zeal, honesty, and determination through their contribution and participation in various uh, social welfare schemes, thereby bringing the, the Nepalese population closer to the Indian thought process and mindset. Because these ex-servicemen are about one lakh of them, we consider ambassadors for Brand India in Nepal. This defense wing provides educational scholarship and vocational training for wards of these ex-servicemen uh, by, by moving to good about 22 district soldier welfare boards, wherein any and every information is disseminated and uh, the wards of defense personnel uh, who are retired get the benefit out of this. A uh, uh, rough estimation of the budget for this scholarship is 5.5 crores of Indian rupees. And this uh, Nepal Bharti Gorkha Sainik Board annually has a meeting chaired by the ambassador of uh, India in Nepal, which is attended by government uh, of Nepal officials, Indian delegations, right from Ministry of Defense, as well as army headquarters to cater for any and every issue which is raised by the ex-servicemen who were part of Indian armed forces earlier and now are residing in their native places. Uh, besides uh, what I said, uh, these uh, defense uh, wing of uh, Nepal Bharti uh, Gurkha board also is instrumental in providing the Indian assistance that is towards medical need, presentation of ambulances, a lot of school buses have been provided by this board. Educational assistance, I will move uh, later uh, because it covers a large number of uh, scholarship. Various, uh, once the, the kids are educated and trained to skill, various welfare placement cells are there in the district boards, which facilitate their employment. Financial assistance to build primary schools is also available to district, uh, I mean, uh, defense wing. Besides, there's a distress grant to cater for natural calamities. And then uh, not to be left behind, we still feel that training of the youth and uh, the, the widows who were there in uh, rural segment or far flung areas of Nepal are to be integrated in the society towards that vocational training is mandatory. So you can read out the number of districts in which these vocational training centers have been opened by uh, defense wing of Indian embassy there. This is a rough glance to the kind of educational scholarships which are available. There are a plethora of them catering from 10th and 12th to the higher education, engineering, medical, uh, you name a thing, including teachers training. Uh, this is a rough uh, indication of the quantum of money which is given at the graduation level, 20,000 per annum, post-graduation, 25,000 professional courses, computer grant of 35,000. I mean, any and every contingency, including uh, marriage of daughter or remarriage of widow, marriage of orphan son of soldiers who have sacrificed their life, they also are given about one lakh rupees of uh, grant. Besides, we have canteen store facilities to facilitate these ex-servicemen in their twilight years, which provides all the day-to-day -day requirement uh, which one needs at their doorsteps. And uh, last but not the least, the ex-servicemen contributory health scheme, which is a wonderful scheme for ex-servicemen, wherein 
He doesn't have to be dependent on any military hospital now. He has the leeway to go to the best of the hospitals which are empaneled under ECHS scheme in Nepal, in their district. And this brings a huge relief to the entire family of ex-servicemen, including their spouses, because all of them are covered under the scheme. Uh, can I intervene for a yes, second? Sir. Yes, sir. I think uh, we are almost out of time. One minute, sir. Of course. Okay. So uh, I, I presume that the major dispute between India and uh, Nepal as of now is the boundary issue, Kalapani and Susta. And besides that, the, the over-encompassing reach of China. So the options and uh, way forward, I'll just uh, read out rather than explaining that the policy, uh, neighborhood first policy under this scheme of government of India, the project should focus on grassroots level participation and people to people connect. The program and project should be managed by local population because then the results would be there for them to see. And that should be incentive for good management. What are these uh, options available? That establishing uh, IT centers, integrating banking system to provide Jandhan kind of facility there, enhancing online services of government utilities to include rural segment, enhancing primary health centers in rural belt, assistance towards establishing MSME for self-reliance of Nepalese uh, citizenship. At par with Indian centers, uh, establishing skill development centers in Nepal, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship management centers, enhancement of scholarship for Nepali students for research in Indian centers of excellence. And revamp of primary uh, education is mandatory as for me, for which a lot of things can be done. And there should be center for training of paramedics because this earthquake uh, which struck Nepal in 2015 showed that the, there is a huge shortfall in trained paramedics. India can come handy towards training that. And development of sources of alternate energy is mandatory now because Nepal is a landlocked country and it is totally dependent on foreign supply of energy that is oil and natural gas. Towards that, since India has played a major role in international solar reliance, windmill, mini hydro projects, this all could be incorporated in Nepal to reduce its dependence on oil and natural gas. And uh, lastly, the military to military cooperation, the number of exercises should be increased and disaster management, counter-terrorism management, joint border management should be included. Besides, modernization of Nepalese armed forces should be taken up by India in a, in a meaningful way so that the relationship reaches and consolidates further. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Singh, for your very comprehensive uh, presentation about an area that uh, excites us uh, quite a lot about the India-Nepal relationship. And uh, now um, we have set up the question and answer session at the end of this whole, uh, when everybody's through with this presentation. So um, uh, now uh, you need to exit. I think you need to click to exit and uh, so that we can uh, invite the next uh, presentation. I think uh, Captain can remain there and uh, Professor Padia, you can invite the next person. All right, okay. I mean, this PowerPoint presentation is uh, sort of, uh, yes. yeah, no problems. So now, of course, the uh, I will, uh, from a micro level, very intense kind of problematic, uh, we should now take a broader look at what is happening. And for that, the uh, most appropriate choice would be to invite uh, Professor Anju Sharan Upadhyay, who has for almost a decade served as the director of Center for the Study of Nepal at Banaras Hindu University. And for two very happening years, he was, uh, she served Tribhuvan University as ICCR chair. And beyond that, I mean, of course, as you know, that uh, she has been interested in Nepal for many long years. And I think she should really uh, uh, sort of build up uh, a broader framework, uh, of course, uh, drawing on the uh, micro level intense presentation by Dr. Singh. So, Professor Anju Sharan Upadhyay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Upadhyay. Um, 
we were having this conversation if I wanted to go at the end, but very generous of you for bringing me in the, you know, earlier than I thought. Um, uh, we're very delighted to, to be partners in this very important exercise that Dr. Jaiswal is, uh, has organized uh, very successfully. I'm reminded of the times that uh, lead scholars, lead politicians of Nepal used to say that we are all the time India bound. And from there to see that it is Nepal that is connecting India to the rest of the world. Uh, it is here that we are meeting Europe after the, during and after the post-conflict time. And it is here that we are actually meeting China. And so this particular event makes it all the more important for some of us here who have been attached to Nepalese studies and researches right from the time it was attempting to graduate into democratic traditions and, and democratic institutions. And, and now is the time that we need to look at the fact that yes, uh, I mean, I, I'm very grateful to uh, Captain Raj Singh for highlighting each of those issues on which India and Nepal have this very strong bonding. And this bonding is something which is uh, very, very uh, important as well as uh, very consequential. It's a unique relationship that India and Nepal have in terms of having a Gurkha regiment and having uh, so much trust in each other that we are extending the status of uh, the highest position uh, in our army of all places uh, to each other. Uh, before I kind of try to identify why we have named this particular panel as New Trajectories is that so far, we've only been talking about India-Nepal uh, friendship, the very strong bonds that, that prevail between India and Nepal, the, I mean, something which has become almost ab obsolete and uh, there are very serious objections from the, the very serious gendered objections on this expression. The, the roti beti relationship, which is now getting translated into the familiar relationship, which pervades uh, not only between the Tarai people, as is very popularly known, you know, the, the people who live on the borders between India and Nepal. And we have a very long border, which is also a very, very travel conducive border. Uh, I'm sure some of the people who are present here on the panel have visited these borders and are very familiar that. Uh, you would not know when the when one country has ended and the other has begun if you were not entering from the check posts. Uh, there are families that have still have kitchens in one country and the living rooms in another country. There are still families that cross the border for the routine grocery and so on and so forth. So there has been, you know, 80% of the people of India are Hindus and so are uh, Nepalese. Uh, there are uh, relationships between the hill people as well as the hill people from India, uh, the the you know elite, the the ruling elite has had uh, you know marital marital relationships with each other, and we can go on and on. We have common rivers, uh, and and one is reminded of that Europe, where it was such a common phrase to say uh, that uh, you know if uh, if France catches cold. Uh, the entire Europe sneezes. I don't know why this is coming to me after almost 40 years of my undergraduate training. Uh, almost similar relationship we have between the two countries. I recall doing a fieldwork uh, research article on Occupy Balwatar that happened in 2012, almost as a consequence as, as a, a, I wouldn't say imitative, but almost as a, as a response to the, uh, you know, Nirbhaya movement of India. So ranging from the army down to the civilians, to the familial, to the religious, to the essential components of food security like water and floods, and to the socio-cultural ecosystem to which both of us belong to. Uh, we have had a, one of the very strong relationship between the two countries. However, and, and we academics are very fond of using this expression, however. So however, Despite this long relationship, one has been perceiving, one has been perceiving that the uh, relationship has been plunging, has been uh, you know going uh, you know from higher to a lower pedestal, and that is something which we simply cannot brush under the carpet, and that starts from right from the time that the 
I mean, so many people would be today talking about the India-Nepal uh, border disputes on Lipulek and Kalapani. Uh, people talk about the, the Indo-Nepal Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1950. Uh, people talk about the so-called discriminatory treaties that were concluded between India and Nepal uh, on the waters of India and Nepal. So despite all this very thick, peaceful, strong relationship that the two countries have had, some of us who are invested in India and Nepal healthy relationships really need to take note of what is going wrong between India and Nepal. And I thought we will stick our net, a neck out and be bold enough to check out on what is wrong. Why is it that the India constituency in Nepal is diminishing? And why is it that the uh, Nepal constituency in India is diminishing? And I'm not talking from any anecdotal references. I'm essentially talking about those researches. Some of them probably you will be having amongst the panelists who are expressing that uh, their field work has revealed that uh, not only in, uh, there is a resentment against India in Nepal, but there is a resentment in India against Nepal as well. And I would like to highlight the scarcity of resources that also prevail in India. But what has triggered that out? Probably the, the Hate India campaign started during the, uh, during the, uh, you know, uh, how, how we say uh, during the, the conflict times, uh, the, I mean, the treaty between India and Nepal figured in one of the 40 points that needed to be implemented by the Maobadis down to a construction of nationalism in Nepal, which was almost on the basis of hate India, only then you will be a real true Nepali. And that has received, that has actually started receiving similar responses, not from people of my generation, but from the people of younger generations. And I would like to highlight the factor that uh, the uneven relationship between India and, and uh, Nepal is on, based on the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, not exclusively on the, on the ground that they were signed by different levels of dictatories, but on the ground that in practice, most of the clauses have now been diluted and the practices of treating each uh, other citizens as equal citizens, as equal nationals is not, per, uh, is not prevailing. Uh, so for instance, for Indians to be able to work in Nepal, there's a registration that is required, which is not very true for Nepalese to come and work here. Uh, Indian, in India is more than happy to recruit Nepalese in their army and in the civilian uh, forces as well. Uh, you would be aware that any Nepali can be a, a candidate for India's civil services as well, one of the most coveted civil service. But there again, so many of our young people whom we teach and we meet in the corridors of our university ever so often question this, that when there is so much of unemployment within this country, should we also not think about restricting it to the people of India? So these are the kinds of irritants that need to, need to be addressed and that need to be conveyed across the border that what is important, it's not a competitive relationship between India and Nepal. I'm very much aware that this diversity or this unequal relationship is because of the unequal size of the two countries. India is way too overwhelming, not only for Nepal, but also for other uh, countries in the region. The, I mean, I always talk to my colleagues in India that you need to visualize if you stand in Kathmandu and visualize South Asia, uh, you know, India looks to be going on the map forever. We would be paranoid if, if Indians would be paranoid if they were sitting in a smaller country. But this is something that needs to be addressed, not only in India, but also in Nepal. And, and that is the idea that we want to convey to, to Nepal, Nepal as well. Bringing down to the to, to have to, to see the chair, it makes you aware that perhaps you've crossed your time. Uh, so, <laughs> and you want to, to limit yourself. Bringing it down to say, for instance, the, the water disputes. Yes, the, the, uh, the major water sources that come to India from, uh, uh, you know, from, from Nepal, Nepal has a right to decide. 
But what is important is, like the treaty, which Nepal has been questioning, India has not been questioning, that Nepal needs to take a stock of it. Nepal needs to decide whether what will be the ground on which the water, water has to be distributed. It's extremely unfortunate that Nepal has had a reasonably unstable political uh, regime. And even though India has been insisting ever since 2008 or even before that, that they are ready to review the Treaty of India-Nepal, I'm sure each one of us know the EPG was set up. And one of the tasks that the EPG had, the Eminent People's Group had, was to revisit the treaty as well. Though it was constructed in Nepal as if it was exclusively for that, but actually it wasn't. It was a far more comprehensive initiative. So one, uh, you know, one point which I would like to make, and I wouldn't say at the outset because I'm looking at the at the watch and I've already done five minutes. So one point on which uh, I would like to, you know, kind of uh, flag this afternoon is that there has to be an awareness in Nepal that perhaps all is not well between India and Nepal, and each of us needs to revisit our relationship with the other. I'm sure Indian security experts would be essentially talking about the security threats. Yes, I'm absolutely aware that the relationship, so many times when I've made these presentations internationally, the question that comes to us, why is it that India is so very much concerned about Nepal? The reason for this has been that Nepal and India have had these open borders. So if Nepal very happily accepts without any scrutiny a visa on arrival of a national of another country that might be inimical to our security system, India has every right to ensure that yes, either the borders between India and Nepal need to be monitored better, which will not be good for our uh, the, the health of the two, uh, the, the health of the mutual relationship of the two countries. But India has reasons to, to remain concerned about how, what are the policies that Nepal is pursuing. And that is where we remain extremely concerned about this uh, whole, the, the unfolding of, uh, you know, cozying with, with countries that might be, in, in, uh, you know, a source of insecurity for India or disrespecting it. I'm very much aware that Nepalese elite and Nepalese masses have a lot of love for India. Same is true of Indians. We share so many things in common. We have, as one of my colleagues used to say, we're almost in each other's intestines. And therefore, to challenge this relationship on these trivial grounds sounds and appears very, very childish. And that is where this needs to be checked. I can go on and on because you know this is a, a platform which has tried to raise these issues, but I've tried to flag these two things essentially that the relationship needs to be revisited, rebuilt. And you know, like uh, as I say, you know, in in uh, older relationships, there are points of discord, but there are also attempts to bring about harmony. So this is a cliched expression: discord, discord, and harmony. Nonetheless, there is an ongoing thing, which is that you simply cannot ignore these upcoming voices, ignore these issues. Nepal of today is not a Nepal of even 20 years ago. Nepal has opened up. The conflict has brought so many players from across the world to Nepal who have tried to well, I wouldn't say manipulate, but yes, made Nepal their home. They have tried to orient Nepalese uh, society, ranging from uh, you know almost everything, including their religiosity and uh, their sexuality, their religiosity. And it is good that the country opens up and uh, tries to reconfigure its relationship or tries to reinvestigate. The, the, in conclusion, I would just make two observations, and that is that there is a lot of soul searching that India needs to do about its relationship with Nepal, engage with, uh, you know, engage with those players that have a more lasting uh, investment in the relationship. And here I'm hinting to uh, those who will be uh, even beyond 65 I'm, I'm mentioning to the about the bureaucrats who generally get their relationship terminated with their postings. Um, and I would prefer that the, the leaders of Nepal and India 
needs to be in constant communication, revisit what are the thorns in our relationship and try to mend that. Only then uh, the relationship between these two countries can become more celebrious. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll get a chance to uh, revert back to this discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anjuji, and uh, really for, uh, as we say in cliched English, casting the net wide, bringing in so many issues, and especially focusing on the changes, the evolution in the way young people are thinking and uh, not so young people are trying to struggle with. So it's time to uh, uh, talk about uh, some emerging geopolitical realities and how do they impinge on uh, uh, India-Nepal relation. So it's my privilege to uh, invite Dr. Lalji Pal. I hope he's around. And uh, Dr. Lalji Pal uh, has been uh, formerly a very dear student of ours and now a very dear colleague at the Department of Political Science, a very earnest uh, teacher and uh, a very earnest researcher. And he has picked up a theme that interests all of us eternally about the geopolitical realities, and especially how does he look at the changes, the continuum of change in this geopolitical reality. So, Dr. Paul, welcome. Excellent. Sir, good afternoon, sir, and Great. respected chair, my teacher. My presentation is on. Uh, Emerging geopolitical realities and Indian politicians. So, under this, I would like to begin with the generalizing the prosperity, the present prosperity and future security of any country depends on its geopolitical, how it's managing geopolitical, how it is positioning. It's a geopolitical capabilities and coping with the challenges and utilizing the possibilities. So under this, as Nepal is a historically have a practice, successfully practiced in a long past, with long past under the policy of Yum between boulders. So this policy is always have inspired Nepal's growth and prosperity between two emerging powers, economic powers of the region, India and China. So this geopolitical possibilities of uh, Nepal's location comes under the Trans-Himalayan region. So Chinese policy of BRI have an implication of on India, Nepal, both it have implications. It is international implications and regional implications. For India, it have a security implication, connectivity implication. For Nepal also, it have a drug and illegal arms smuggling, the human trafficking, and other many implications. So this geopolitical reality is becoming more complex by the emergence of uh, the, uh, capture of Taliban, uh, Kabul by Taliban, and this COVID crisis is so becoming more complex and relevant for the India Nepal relation. How to Nepal have to be positioned itself? How it is uh, trying to use the connectivity, utilize the connectivity between India and Nepal and how it is a managing connectivity from China under the project of Quingay, Tibet, 
रेलवे लिंक तो एक्सटेंशन ऑन लाहाशा एंड काठमांडू सो दिस विल बी अगेन एक्सटेंडेड टू इन साउथ एशियन रीजन गेट वे ऑफ इंडिया उत्तर प्रदेश एंड बिहार सो हाउ दिस कनेक्टिविटी नेपाल इज ए गोइंग टू यूज इफ इट इज यूजिंग इन टर्म्स ऑफ इकोनॉमिक प्रॉस्पेरिटी then it will benefit nepal under its policy long historical policy but it is having a implication for india and other aspect of uh, india nepal relation is uh, under the many infrastructure development initiated by china and uh, india also so india have a uh, rakshol rakshol virganj kathmandu railway link so janakpur jayanagar railway project and jobani biratnagar so sonali upadiya and other projects so all these projects will connect nepal to india for it it's uh, economic prosperity so this economic prosperity can be capitalized only by two things uh, how nepal is uh, managing its internal political stability and what have its implica- implication to india so india always prefer support to stabilization of democracy in nepal will be a beneficial for the india then other aspect of uh, uh, this connectivity is uh, connectivity project and uh, energy project there is a mcc project by america then india have uh, around 90 9000 megawatt project uh, have a targeted to bring this hydroelectric project in nepal which is a very big economic boost for the nepal and uh, it will be also utilized and transported for india and other neighboring south asian region so through this nepal can get a benefit economic benefit and uh, there is a other socio cultural and civilization the link is between nepal and india which can be like ramayana corridor and uh, buddhist circuit through this nepal can rejuvenate and can minus the india nepal relations for for benefit in getting benefit from this connectivity and infrastructure development projects so many other things of this my presentation is already by taken avaj given i my teacher anju sharan padhyay ma'am so i want to say that in conclusion that nepal can mine how nepal is going to mine is its uh, present geo strategic possibilities by not annoying india it can utilize the chinese project and whatever uh, optional as alternative for over dependence on on india but this is uh, by assuring india ki any policy of nepal will not going to risk indian security and policy so thank you so much i'm uh, stopping here uh thank you so much uh, dr pal for uh, uh, expanding the uh, canvas of uh, discussion and uh, added new ideas uh, we appreciate your uh, you know innovative ways in which you look look, look which you look at the problem now uh, may i request you to exit and uh,
so that we can invite the next uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Now, um, I next in line is uh, Dr. Prashant Kumar. I hope uh, he is around. He was unwell, but so nice to see you, Prashant. Uh, Prashant. I'm is, here, sir. Very good. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Prashant uh, is a well known uh, uh, watcher, observer, and scholar of uh, Nepal. His doctorate was on some very sensitive and specific area of Nepalese politics. And currently he serves as the assistant professor in Malvia Center for Peace Research. And I'm very tempted to add that he's one of the most brilliant young scholars that we have on the horizon. So just watch out for him. So uh, uh, Dr. Prashant will be speaking on uh, India-Nepal, uh, revisiting India-Nepal 1950 treaty and uh, the Indian concerns, because normally I think in India, people know more about the Nepalese reservations, but they uh, do not really reckon with uh, what kind of uh, issues, what kind of insecurities, anxieties, uh, which uh, the security uh, policy makers and watchers have in India. So welcome Dr. Prashant and uh, please carry on with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, respected chair. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are very much. Uh, I am supposed to speak, sir, uh, just a sort of clarification. I'm supposed to speak on the Madhesi issues, sir. Oh, I apologize. Uh, yeah, there's been a little misprint. I apologize. Yes. Uh, and please carry on. Actually, it's more befitting because uh, we have another speaker uh, talk, you know, speaking on the treaty question. So Madhesis would be uh, add a new flavor. So please carry on. We will correct it when uh, I think the organizers uh, do a certification for this participation. Please. Uh, thank you so much, respected chair. At the outset, I want to place on record my sense of gratitude to excellent and dynamic team of NIS, uh, especially Pramodji and his dynamic uh, leadership. And Professor Anju, ma'am, for you know floating this uh, wonderful uh, panel as such. Uh, I'm a bit uh, unwell, so please, uh, I'm just extending my apology in advance if I'm a bit disorganized. Uh, uh, my presentation is supposed to speak on the institutional practices and constitutional provisions of Nepal from the Madhesi perspective and how it is having sort of impact on the Indo-Nepal relationship and how we can improve it. Uh, that is like broadly two, three areas where I will be speaking on. We all know that Madhesis are uh, a contentious term. Uh, historically speaking, it is a sort of geographical, ethno, social, economic connotation. Uh, sometimes it is used as an interchangeably with the people who are resident of the southern part of Nepal, which is Karai, which is nearby the India's border. And uh, we know that we share like 1761 kilometer of border with uh, Nepal, uh, joining the five Indian state from West Bengal, Sikkim to Uttarakhand, in between Bihar, UP, and uh, <coughs> so. These three, uh, we must keep in mind that Madhesis are primarily being treated always as the second class citizen in its own country. And the recent upsurge in the Madhesis movement, especially the wake of the promulgation of the seventh constitution of the Nepal, the latest one in the offering on 20th September 2015, where there are some sort of, you know, exclusionary positionings and some sort of institutional provisions which are directly against the so-called consensus, which is being, you know, reached about in the previous moments, like in 2007, where first time uh, after the Madhesi uprising, the federal agenda of Nepal was at the core, and that was accepted by all the big parties, especially big three, the big three political parties, and. Uh, in 2015 constitution, and we, we know that it was just uh, promulgated out of haste in the wake of the, you know, uh, coming out with the consensus in the post uh, uh, earthquake 
ठीक है नेपाल दैट इट इज बींग प्रोमोलगेटेड प्राइमरली फ्रॉम ए पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू ऑफ द डिस्क्रिमिनेटरी पोजिशन फॉर द नॉट ओनली इंडिजीनियस थारूज एंड मधेसी gendered justice perspective as well there are clear uh, provisions in constitutions which are directly against the basic norms of the gender justice especially the citizenship provisions is directly though it constitutionally speaking it says that you read foreigner in the law book but you can on the practical ground we can read it like indians so any nepalese women and we know that this is a common practice across the border that any nepalese women who is married to a foreigner and here read it india uh, is being denied their offsprings and uh, is being denied the sort of natural citizenship and uh, uh, totally debarred from holding any constitutional positions as such and this is in the fear of the wake of the fear that uh, there is a growing i would say as madam anju madam has rightly pointed out that there is a growing tendency in nepalese elite especially in the kathmandu centric hill centric mahon chhatri elite that we somehow define nepalese nationalism now vis a vis you know anti india sentiments nowadays so the i think thumping masculine toxic language of nepalese nationality nationalism was something directly you know coming out from those hill centric mahon chhatri khas dominated areas this defines that these madhesis population are necessarily you know pro indians and their their sentiments and their transactional emotional loyalties are always attached with the their cross border brethrens who has had having a sort of family and strong familial ties emotional ties one of the recent example we can we cannot recall it very back that uh, I'll, I'll, uh, just before the vidya devi bandari the president and the vice president both were madhesis rambaran yadav and uh, parmanand jha and we should not be surprised that parmanand jha is having a direct descendant of the indian origin family as such so this is something you know coming out with a direct uh, i would say a uh, growing uh, uh, from especially from mr oli redeems and he came out in 2015 for the first time that uh, it was uh, defined primarily from a uh, anti indian sentiments i think another important factor is also here we must keep in mind that the federalization of the nepalese politics is also something which is very deeply deeply problematic in the sense that out of 165 constituencies which is given in the constitution only 65 areas are given in uh madhesi areas and hundreds constituencies are given in hill and tarai uh, hill and you know, pahar centric areas madhesi is were demanding the horizontal from east to west the horizontal distribution of the state and it was being given like the vertical the sliced one where the most of the tarai dominated districts apart from i think uh, province number 2 only province number 2 uh, rest of the out of seven rest of the six provinces are given such a political gerrymandering that uh, madhesis are like uh, minorities in their own land again you can problematize this many notions and there are you know many watchers and takers of the nepalese politics who are having a sort of weariness about the growing demands of the adesis and they are thinking that uh, if being promoted and uh, being bolstered by the indian side this madhesi identity assertion will somehow someday you know uh, prove the demand for a sort of another sri lankaization of the indian polit uh, nepalese politics it will create a sort of tamil uh, sort of another uh, tamil like demands in uh, sri lanka as we have uh, witnessed it so they are still, uh, worried about and uh, some, some somebody is still worried you know i i know during my field work i i, I came across many nepalese elite uh, politicians who are you know somehow sarcastically saying that uh, we don't allow 
the Tarai politics to be like another extension of the Bihar politics. We won't allow this Biharization of the Madhais as such. So that sort of, you know, political distrust and uh, I would say a very masculine understanding of a very limited exclusionary nationalism is something which is directly at the core of the recent upsurge and that is directly linked to the historical uh, discrimination and uh, I think uh, very, very second class treatment of the Madhesi people. Despite being the fact that they are having the maximum control over the land issues, they are having the maximum control in terms of the geographical location. Most of the industries, most of the uh, food processing industries, most of the agriculture sectors industry, GDP in the terms of industrial production and all are coming from Madhes areas. But uh, their dominance in terms of political power, I think except the state number two, there are very less likelihood of chances of becoming a Madhes as the chief minister in the federal uh, part of the Nepalese politics. And there lies the problem of a, you know, institutional uh, exclu exclusionary treatment as such and the constitutionally as such also being deviated from so many earlier, you know, promises and consensus which were being re re reached by the Nepalese polity and the Madhesi agitating parties, especially the consensus of the 2007 and 2008. Here, I want to add another dimension is about the historical practices of, you know, I mean, most of you will be, you know, will be surprised to know that up to 1954, uh, we have had, I think, only countries example in the our eyes where Madhesis do require a sort of visa system to enter the capital itself. They require a sort of you know uh, entry passport to enter their own capital. This was the you know the level of their being sarcastically being always being termed as a dhoti wala or hindi wala speaking guy or a mathli speaking guy and that sort of you know historical discrimination. There are systematic denial in terms of highest form of judiciary, civil services, all those, you know, public acclaims of power. Right now, the constitution provisions somehow symbolizes, though despite being the fact that they provide 45% of the reservation, and the list is so big, and such a generic term are being used, that you will be surprised to know that 45% reservation is being extended to, say, category like youth, khas, hill centric uh, youth, women, such a generic terms are being used. Almost, I mean, everybody, everything is there. So I think uh, one of the important parameters we must keep in mind that despite, uh, without being, you know, despite doing the prioritization exercise, Nepalese are trying not only to placate all sort of demands, but also giving from one hand and taking from another one. So that sort of, you know, political gerrymandering and uh, political maneuvering also in terms of, you know, not opening up their heart and mind to their own people is somehow creating a sort of uh, another problem in terms of uh, ethnicization of the Madhesi politics. And there lies the genuine fear of radicalization of Madhesi youth, if not being adequately being covered and if not being adequately being uh, listened out by the Nepalese elite, uh, there are real dangers of, you know, having a sort of, you know, terminalization of the, because the population is so much, you know, beautifully synthesized there in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pahari and the Madhesi population, and they live side by side since uh, many decades there. But there are, you know, uh, continuous efforts of the political engineered, human plantation as such also in the history. And that sort of, you know, created a, uh, with the historically very, very disjointed notion of a Birta system. Birta was a very unique innovation of the Nepalese Rana Shahi regime, where lots of lands are being given as a reward for, you know, for their services to the royal court. And they are mostly given in and around the East West Highway nearby the Madhesi areas.
So uh, I will just uh, touch a few points here that how does it impact India-Nepal relationship and how uh, we can improve some sort of, you know, one important factor is that, uh, that uh, and I think I, I want to quote here our respected chair himself, he always used to very fondly say, and that is very pertinent question to ask, uh, that uh, why this uh, sort of what you call in Sanskrit ati parichayat vay manashyata ye jo ati parichay ki se utpanna ek tarah ki vay manashyata hoti hai that is something which is of the deeply problematic we are you know singing pants of the, our you know natural affinity and all sort of natural bonding and beti roti ka relationship and historical relationship and everything and i think such an unparalleled such an unparalleled sort of you know relationship which you never find anywhere in terms of religion language race cuisine everything but despite the fact that such a deep distrust why so that we need to you know seriously ponder and here i think one of the important factor is that that we must keep in mind the fact that uh, we must not allow our South Asian neighbors to interpret their nationalism vis-a-vis -vis India. We must not. Why not they just allow, uh, why not they just uh, define their nationalism from uh, something like uh, on a very, very positive frontiers. We are also some sort of, you know, victim of that sort of uh, defining our nationalism vis-a-vis -vis our, you know, troubled neighbor sometimes but at least there are you know positive contours of defining our nationalism uh, from a, their own you know intrinsic capacities and uh, internal political idiosyncratic uh, characteristics as such another important factor we must keep in mind that uh, growing ethnicization of the south asian politics uh, uh, nepal must must i think go for a, I think, doable sort of, doable sort of expectation and uh, priority uh, framework. What is happening now that ne in Nepal, everything becomes so politicized, so much politicized. So name of a few, anything, and we, we want uh, each and everything to be done by the constitution itself. Each and everything to be Say, for instance, some people are demanding that we must have the right to food, right to shelter, right to housing, right to uh, all sort of, you know, uh, right as the fundamental right without taking into cognizance the internal capacity of the state itself. So if you want to short circuit many things and are rightly being pointed out by Anju Ma'am that uh, uh, in the last 10, 20 years or so, Nepal has witnessed such a tremendous sense of, you know, change, which is being witnessed by many other countries in centuries. But despite being the fact that we are, you know, some sort of become a victim of the two poli over politicization of everything. So we need to little bit slow and constitution is all about, to my mind, and I think India's constitution is one of the finest example of that, to just make a, I think, best comprehensive possible consensus making exercise. At least you can have the consensus of the comprehensive order, maximum con uh, consensus. 100% consensus is never possible, not possible, but it should be most comprehensive exercise. And constitution must not be uh, like uh, one uh, cloth, you know, fit for all sort of solution. So it is just, a, I would say, uh, uh, a holy book, uh, just a good uh, intention of the political aspirations and the willingness of the people of the Nepal, and let it remain so. And uh, on the ground, we should be, you know, given clarity to the, you know, uh, bringing the level of the economic status of the people. And for that, I think cross-border uh, active engagement is must. Uh, revisiting the India-Nepal uh, uh, treaty in terms of the security perception uh, is also on the line uh, pipeline there, and we need to have a better connectivity. Another important factor is, and uh, I think uh, people uh, here will take on record that thing also, that uh, why not we can just have a, you know, 
special educational scholarship provision for Madhesi people uh, in the Indian Academia and Indian Universities and to be given a, a special leeway for all the Nepali uh, citizens, all the Nepali city, barring their nationality and everything, and just to allow to maybe make payment in Indian rupees. Why they are supposed to pay in dollars? This is, I think, uh, one of the important small gestures which we can do. Uh, because nowadays, uh, what we are witnessing that most of the uh, Nepali students are going to China, right? And that is something, you know, create a sort of uh, another soft power constituency in Nepal. I mean, look, one Hamid Karjai happens to be a student of Himachal University in Simla. We have some that sort of, you know, leeway in Afghanistan based on that sort of, you know, institutional affiliation and his uh, affiliation in Indian University. Why not we can do? And initially that was the case, at least three, four, so just one minute. Okay. <laughs> and then concluding. So that is my last, uh, uh, just I want to offer something. Uh, another important factor is about the growing distrust over the security parameters of Indian people also uh, in terms of Nepalese uh, border related, you know, growing Chinization in the border areas where you have a Confucius study center now in the growth. There are many, you know, other important uh, aspects about the growing radicalization of the jihadi funded, uh, some radicalized notion of uh, petro dollars as such also, that we also keep in mind that uh, Nepal has to take cognizance of that. So thank you so much. And uh, again, I would like to thank and place my uh, gratitude, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prashant. Uh, we actually would, would have loved to listen to you, your real and conceptual narrative for a long time, but uh, we have a participant. Our next participant is Dr. Sneha Patel, and uh, she, uh, in her college, or in her university, actually, uh, she is, uh, there is a celebrity visiting, and she was given just 10 minutes window from one <laughs> Indian standard time. So I uh, invite her uh, without losing time, Dr. Sneha, and I think she's speaking on the treaty, the um, friendship treaty, which is uh, always uh, in our imagination. Uh, Sneha, please. Good afternoon, uh, respected professor, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my topic is changing perceptions of India on 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Uh, as we know, the relationship between India and Nepal are very close since the ancient times. And the most interesting fact is that whenever we talked about the relationship between India and Nepal, we always began our point with this line, close relationship. And this is a reality. There are many things that build close linkages type of uh, relations, like sociological ties, security and economic interdependence, and common tradition and cultural faith. These are the things that are actually working behind the closeness of relations. Uh, in this regard, the 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship, the 1950 Treaty, uh, Treaty of Peace and Friendship is one of the most important treaties that cover all those issues. I know it's old dated, but we can't say it's not relevant because there are many things which prove importance. The most uh, relevant thing is that it's still providing jobs and education to the citizens of each other nation because of an open border. Uh, and we can't deny this fact. The 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship between the two countries that accord national treatment to the citizen of one country into the other country made the relations still stronger. And because of this clause, nearly 8 million Nepali citizens live and work in India and around 6 lakhs Indians are living and domiciled in Nepal. According to Government of India, provides around uh, 3,000 scholarship seats annually to Nepalese nationals for various courses at the PhD, Masters, Bachelor, and plus two levels in India and in Nepal. These scholarships cover a wide spectrum of subjects, including engineering, medicine, agriculture, pharmacology, veterinary, uh, sciences, computer applications, business administration, music, film, arts, etc. Uh, on the other hand, many Indian students also inclining towards uh, medical courses in Nepal. It's not one-sided. 
uh, it is the recent time, in September 2020, the government of India has provided 1.54 billion Nepali rupees to Nepal for the fulfilling its commitment towards post earthquake reconstruction assistance. And in April 2021, uh, MOU, a memorandum for understanding, was signed between the Indian Embassy, Nepali Minister of Federal Affairs and General Administration, and Tripya Municipality for the co construction of a new building for Sri Bal Mandir Secondary School, Tripya Municipality. So, government has been working in different areas. Uh, this is since 2003 under the High Impact Community Development Project, SICDP scheme, earlier known as SDP, Small Development Project. The government of India has taken up over 520 of which 448 projects have been completed in the areas of health, education, drinking water, connectivity, sanitation, and creation of other public utilities in across all seven province, provinces of Nepal. India has inaugurated two projects in Nepal which were built with India's grant assistance of a total of Nepal rupees 89.2 million. India has so far provided grant assistance of 21.99 crore to Nepal, Netra Jyoti Sangh, which managed the Fatehbal Eye Hospital, conducting 400 diagnostic screening and treatment camps and surgery camps for contracting 52 districts and for TT in 14 districts and for holding eye camps in school in remote areas of Nepal. Uh, there's another one is that the Rapti Cold Storage Building is equipped to preserve vegetables, fruits, and perishable agriculture products. The fully operational new cold storage facility is envisaged to help farmers of the area to prolong the commercial value of their agri produce and is expected to assist in raising incomes of small and medium farmers of the area. It has also gifted 823 ambulances to various government and not for profit organizations working in the health sector in Nepal. This is all due to the uh, pandemic era. Uh, the government of India has undertaken several initiatives to enhance road connectivity with neighboring countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal. And in this regard, a memorandum of understanding to extend Indian assistance of 500 crores for strengthening road infrastructure in the Sarai area of Nepal was signed with the government of Nepal in 2016. According to the government report, the Senate work is in the final stages of implementation with 13 of the 14 road packages already completed. In addition, concessional loans amounting to approximately 2,086 crores have been extended to Nepal for ongoing road projects. India always stands with its neighboring country and its these are the uh, examples of them. Recently, in response to media queries on recent political developments in Nepal, the official spokesperson said, we have taken note of the recent political developments in Nepal. We view these as internal matters of Nepal to be dealt with by them under their own domestic framework and democratic processes. As a neighbor and friend, India remains unwavering in its support for Nepal and its people on their journey towards progress, peace, stability, and development. It means the government of India always tries to convey that it never wanted to in intervene in internal matters, but they always stand beside its close neighbor. I've also taken several interviews of Nepal as, a, uh, as well as Indian citizens for their yeah. opinions about uh, Dr. Sneha, can I uh, request you to just wind up uh, as yes, we, uh, yeah, please, in just next uh, couple of minutes at the best, please. So most of them are common people, students, scholars, and teachers, and most of them who have been taking advantage provided by the treaty are happy for the provision of national treatment and an open border. Because some people cross the border to receive education in the best universities in India, some for jobs, and some for their spiritual beliefs to live in Kashi or Varanasi. So there are many people who have been living in India for many years and do not leave any place, whether it is India or Nepal, because there are, there are some family members or relatives have been living in India and some were in Nepal, and they visit time to time each place. So there will be a dilemma for them because what if in the future they will have to choose between them? So 
I conclude. Uh, we conclude that the pandemic has shown us that we must live together to fight every kind of problem. And India and Nepal can maintain their relations in a good way because they have already deep rooted ties. There is only need to polish it and to grab the existing opportunity. Uh, for that, every coin has two faces, and we need to focus on the positive areas because there is more opportunity and is also broader than the negative one. It means that the citizen of both nations can set a unique example of friendship to the world. Altogether, we can grow our economy, and still we have good economic relationship. We have good people to people relationship, and there is also more possibility to improve it in a broader sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Neha, <coughs> for your <coughs> very <coughs> sorry precise presentation, raising some very good questions. We have uh, two more uh, presentations coming in before we go in for Q and A session. And, um, and um, Sarita Bartola, independent researcher, and she talks about challenges and prospects of Nepal's foreign policy. May I? ask uh, the learned speaker to quickly uh, wind up her presentation. And when you make your slide, assume that we are reading it. So you don't have to read it. You just add things so that we can finish your presentation in next six to seven minutes, please. Thank Sorry. you, Dr. Upad. Thank you, Dr. Upadhyay. Can you hear me? Yes, of course I can. Go yeah, um, there are so many points, good points already covered. So I'll try to make it as uh, short as possible. So hi everyone, my name is Sarita Bertola and today I will be talking about Nepal's foreign policy. The majority of the issues um, we have in the slides are already covered and I'll try to, uh, as I said, I'll just try to make it as short as possible. Um, in this uh, panel, I don't think I even have to say that Nepal is a small landlocked country um, that is in between two gigantic power, India and China. Nepal's foreign policy is significantly impacted by its geographical features and its history and relationship with its neighbor. Constitutionally, foreign policy of Nepal is guided by the principle of United Nations Charter, non-alignment, punch seal, international laws, and the value of the world peace. So um, I'm not going to read the slides as said by Dr. Bade. If we look at the history of, if we look at the history of Nepal, Nepal foreign uh, policy is uh, considered to be one of the oldest in Asia. Nepal, um, Nepal's foreign office is considered as one of the oldest in Asia because in 19, in 1769, after the Nepal unification by Prithivinarayan Shah, the office called JC Kota was established to look after the foreign affair, especially focusing on the relationship between Tibet and China. Later during uh, um, Rana regime, JC Kota was named as Munsi Khana, and in 1934, Munsi Khana was referred as the foreign department. And in 1951, Nepal established the independent Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, coming all the way from uh, 1769 to 2021, Nepal has um, expanded its, its diplomatic relationship within almost uh, 171 countries. So while looking over the foreign policies of Nepal, I'll try to I try to look at the policies as the internal determinant as internal and external determinants. Uh, Nepal, as we all know, Nepal is a developing economics dealing with the extended period of the political transition. The nation is struggling to improve the economic performance and the major problem we are facing at this point is to attract the significant number of FTI. Also, even Nepal is well known for great Gurkhas and it's one of the top country to send peace force in peace force to UN and we also have like as um, mentioned by the Previous presenter, we have a huge number of armies in India and Europe. Despite of the all this strength we talk, Nepal is still uh, considered as one of the weak country for the military strength. Based upon its size, economic performance, military strength, Nepal's foreign policy is considered as small and weak. Therefore, Nepal foreign policy is not directed towards influencing and internationally, but towards um, preserving autonomy and addressing the domestic economics and security issues. 
So um, looking over the Nepal's foreign policy, I'll talk about the relationship with neighbor. Most of the, um, the issues about the relationship with India has been covered in the previous, um, by the previous presenter. I just want to highlight that Nepal and India relationship is one of the most beautiful and unique relationship in the world. And it has a very a long history. Despite of a long history, like a sharing of the border, I don't think any of the country in the world even shared the border as uh, beautifully as we do. Despite of everything, uh, all the relationship and the history, these countries still have, there are lots of issues the country are still dealing with. Um, after the blockade in 2015, the relationship has been, um, I'll just consider this relationship as a bittersweet and the bitterness has been added after the blockade in 2015 and which was the bitterness was more emphasized by the issues um, in 2020 when Nepal and India both issued a new, released a new map um, highlighting the conflict zone. So I'll not expand that, that has been um, already covered. Similarly, the um, relationship of Nepal with um, other, um, Nepal have a you know, good relationship with other um, international organizations um, and also bi bilateral relationship with a country like France, Germany, Japan, Malaysia, Southeast, Switzerland, United States and UK. Um, I'll just cover the challenges of, um, Nepal and the challenge of foreign policy in Nepal in this slide. As I have already told previously, Nepal, uh, the, the major challenges we are facing is a political instability, where um, uh, politically instability, economic performance, and the relationship with the neighbors. There are, there, as I mentioned previously, there are so many issues that we need to revisit with India and China as well. And the, um, the other, other major issues are the experience of the policymaker and diplomat in the foreign relationship relationship and the uh, level of the, and the diplomat we choose in the different ambitions of Nepal, um, Nepal in other country. The foreign direct investment, we are um, struggling to attract more foreign direct investment in the country. We are the, um, we are consider ourselves as a labor surplus country, despite of being a labor surplus country, we are not able to attract the uh, foreign direct investment as much as we should be. As uh, I didn't mention in the slide, but all, another issues I see is in money laundering. Nepal, the different study shows that Nepal is a fertile land for money laundering based upon the, all the security issues mentioned previously with the open border and the relationship with the two gigantic power. Um, both China and India, Nepal have to talk um, about how we will manage the money laundering issues and avoid Nepal for being one of the fertile land for the money laundering. Um, as mentioned, the challenge, the um, issues we need to improve is the um, in how, like improve the political in st political stability of the country, improve the relationship with India, and um, our relationship with China is improving and to strengthen the relationship with China. Uh, along with the neighboring country, we are um, Nepal need to expand its relationship with other allies and the other nations just to avoid the issues like blockade that has happened in the past and um, um, in. In the focus on the economic prosperity and improve the skill of the human resource and Ministry of Finance. Um, just to conclude and not to repeat what has been spoken previously, I'd like to conclude that Nepal's foreign policy is not directed towards projecting influence internationally, but towards preserving autonomy and addressing domestic economy, uh, domestic economy and security issues. And the, one of the biggest suggestions would be Nepal and India so sit together and dialogue about their relationship and strengthen the relationship in a positive way. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarita ji. Very well timed, very relevant. Thank you. And now uh, we have our last uh, panelist, uh, Neha Manjari. She's an assistant professor at Patliputra University, and she speaks on uh, the uh, problem solving mechanism. That's how I read it India Nepal border dispute. So, uh, welcome, Neha. And uh, I please don't get uh, disheartened that you are the last speaker, but I think we have, we, you have become wiser and we have become wiser enough. 
but please uh, take your time but time is short as you know so seven five to seven minutes and uh, please go ahead sarita Thank you so much. Uh, sir, uh, could you tell me that I'm audible or not? Yes, you are very much, very resound. And uh, sir, can I share my uh, 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 screen over here? I mean, if you have uh, some, if you can manage without it, fine. Otherwise, please do, but then run sir, through. Run through. I will go through a slide so that uh, it will be finished in within the time. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for providing this opportunity. So I'm Neha Manjri and right now I'm uh, working as a student professor in Padliputra University, Patna. So uh, topic for today will be India-Nepal border dispute and uh, the issues and pragmatic resolving mechanisms. So uh, let's begin. Okay, so uh, Nepal is a landlocked country that uh, that is sandwiched between uh, India and China. Everybody knows that. And uh, Uh, okay, so uh, with uh, the relationship of Nepal and India's uh, border is that uh, India shares uh, approximately 1808 kilometers of border area with Nepal, in which uh, 1213 kilometers and remaining 595 kilometers come under a river border system. So there is land border system also and river border system also. This border, uh, this open border system has generated a great and significant friendship relationship amongst those, those two countries. Uh, the level and cooperation has been so magnanimous that movement of people across border is free and unhindered. The basis of India-Nepal uh, India relationship and friendship and cooperation more specifically comes into picture, not only because of open border system, but also similar culture, tradition, way of living, colonial past, etc. Although the border is served by close socio-economic ties and cultural exchanges, the skirmishes along the border has been in newspaper time and again. This border also faces problem of smuggling, drugs, armed trafficking, terrorism, insurgency, and other petty crimes. These issues, these issues calls for strict, more strict and pragmatic mechanism that will closely regulate the border and are of main are and are main tightly. Uh, tightly regulated uh, border area and associated gray areas. Both the countries should uh, act sincerely and holistically to enhance the mutual relationship and diminish cross-border issues. Uh, why the border is, uh, what is, what is the border issue and how it is relevant, we'll see. Next, uh, the, board, the border word, it signifies that uh, the geographical boundary is imposed either by geog uh, geographical features like terrains, uh, uh, maybe ocean agreement by political heads. These, uh, their genesis lie in col colonial time or war or feasible symbiotic agreement between concerned political entities of the area. The border are of different type, like these are political, natural, geometrical, fiat, landscape etc the border during the border uh, use uh, border is very important because okay so uh, the border uh, uh, during ancient and medieval period was important uh, because it used to regulate the capital movement of uh, people and also the people movement so it was very important so the uh, concept was that it should be liberal and it should be free in origin so that move, uh, me, movement can happen and the economic uh, uh, economic growth can happen to both the parties uh, in Nepal case, in Indo-Nepal case is that uh, the border is of open regulate, uh, open border system and the friendship perspective and this, this, uh, this border system, uh, uh, this border system finds its origin in the friendship treaty of 1950. Historically, British East India Company had colonized part of both Nepal and India. The, uh, the then uh, Anglo war of 1814 and the treaty of 1816 resulted in delimitation and demarcation of India-Nepal border. Additionally, Indo-Nepal Peace Friendship Treaty, uh, which was signed in uh, 1950, identifies the open border system of the states. Uh, uh, the issues on Nepal, uh, Indo-Nepal uh, border. These are like uh, uh, first uh, Limpi, Dhyadhura, Lipu Lake and Kalapani areas are most controversial border areas. Historically, Kalapani is Limpudhara stretch east of Kali River belongs to Nepal, but interpretation of India claims that Kali River uh, to Kali, uh, Kalapani, Limpu, Yadhura region along with Lipu Lake region is under 
India is sovereign area. Also, uh, also there is a uh, case of Susta uh, uh, Susta village, which was which used to be in Nepal part, but due to the course uh, due to the course of uh, river. Uh, uh, Gandaki. Now uh, it is uh, that Sista River comes in uh, India. So uh, this is also a bo uh, bone of contention between both the uh, country. Uh, right now, if we see the present deployment si si situation, now both the country has been deploying their armed personnel. In India's case, it is like uh, paramilitary force have been deputed by India for every five kilometer border. There is a post constructed, and for every one kilometer distance, there are twenty five SSBs. In Nepal, similarly, in the case of Nepal, Nepalese government has deployed armed for, uh, police force on border areas in 87 border outposts for security and revenue purpose. A total of 4,740 armed for, uh, police force have been recruited. Uh, now the recent issue, this uh, this border dispute escalated when into uh, 2020. Uh, 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 a breeze was inaugurated by Rajna Singh, the defense minister, uh, uh, on uh, uh, on the road to Mansour River. So this was uh, a, a area. Uh, this was a quite an essential uh, topic for both the country because it uh, border is something that uh, that is concerned with the sovereignty of nation. So the contra uh, this controversy deepened when both the uh, both the government claimed that the area to, uh, is theirs. And having and uh, they were not having a constructive dialogue for resolving the diplomatic crisis and allegation on each other. This was uh, this was called uh, significant disrespect of. Obviously, this was a significant yeah. disrespect of treaty yeah, of. So give just, us, just, uh, yeah, give us some time for the deliberation. We just have uh, eight minute, ten minutes for the deliberation. I'm sorry, but please. So just I'm uh, I have just a closer statement, sir. Yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, because this issue is very uh, important, and so this will, should be like all the where there are very much uh, there are extremely hostile uh, states uh, that have found the solution. So, uh, Nepal and India should also come together and uh, sit together and think out of box and build a practical, workable sit solution so that no third party enters and interfere in the matter. So, thank you. It's over to you now. Thank you so much. Uh Neha, and uh, as we said uh, at the preface, that uh, we tried uh, to bring in very senior scholars with uh, very young and promising uh, researchers to stimulate interest in this very promising field. And uh, I can say as the chair that that particular experiment has been very rewarding. Now, uh, we uh, don't have much time uh, left, but uh, uh, we have uh, some questions uh, that can that are being posed to uh, all the uh, mm, uh, uh, participants, the panelists. I will read one from uh, Ankita Singh to everyone. Uh, and the question goes that in the geopolitical context, uh, she wants the panel to perhaps focus on the Chinese political influence and their extended engagement in Nepal that might be impacting indo nepalese relation. So the China uh, factor, and I think this is this, this, the, the, you know, it's like the elephant in the room situation. So how would you like to uh, sort of and Neha, you can exit because I think we the question answer is for everybody. Okay, so thank you. Can exit your PowerPoint. So probably um, we have all the um, uh, panelists, and um, uh, I don't know whom to begin. But anybody interested in talking about the China factor? As we know, this China used to be very exciting. Every city in the world has this China town, China factor. It's very exciting. So who will take this? Yes, please go on. Unmute yourself, please. The every nation uh, has its right to interact with any nation in the world for its uh, prosperity. Since China is also a neighbor of Nepal, a sovereign country, it has all its right to interact with Chinese counterpart. But then 
going by the example of Chinese uh, economic intrudence into the countries uh, in our neighborhood, uh, Sri Lanka itself, it is evident the kind of uh, economic bonhomi China goes through and eventually what is the outcome of that. So uh, keeping in view the traditional Indo-Nepal relationship, our Nepalese friend and leadership should factor in and decide for their own good which country is better and should reap the best out of both the countries for their own national interest and economic development. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Uh, is there any other uh, dimension that somebody would like to raise here? We have still time. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> I'll let Sarita speak. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's really interesting question. I think that has been a question since um, when we, since like keep uh, our Prime Minister, when they raise um, hand towards the China, but we forget the fact about uh, when did like in a history. I always try to see how the history, how the relationship of India and Pakistan is strengthened. India and not Pakistan. I'm sorry, India and Nepal is strengthened. Is there are so many cultural, social aspect that goes together, and and if we look over the political scenario when Nepal was ruled by either, either Rana or. Um, or skiing, or then we come to the democratic democratic leadership congress and the similar political strategies in India. It has always been um, support to each of the party regarding um, their political viewpoint as well. And we have always been away from the communist um, political system in the China. And uh, definitely uh, after um, we we slowly start introduce after the um, king we started um, having our relationship with China. China. We always have relationship with China, but it was strengthened um, after the after we um, throw the king away. Uh, if we see when did we strengthen the relationship was, we always need to consider it was after the blockade, where Nepal was suffering. That's a time where the nations of the country and political leader themselves realize, realize that we should not have depend on only we being a landlocked country, we we should not depend on only one nation uh, for the uh, for the support or for our um, resource. That's where country and the citizen all um, request, uh, and they are happy to expand their relationship with China. And I don't see any harm from Nepal's side on um, enhancing their friendship with China. I think there is a there is always a. Um, maybe it's like um, India being protective to Nepal and it's like, yeah, that's our brother and we want Nepal to be on our side, but we need to understand it's not like Nepal being a friend with China is not Nepal weakening the relationship with India. Nepal has been an independent country, can strengthen the relationship with both uh, India and China. And at the same time, at the same time, India, Nepal can be uh, one of the, prime um, factor to, stroll, to, start in, to improve the dialogue between India and China as well. Thank very, you. Very, very well said, uh, very well said, very candidly said. Uh, Professor Anju Sharan, would you like to uh, chip in here? I think we are not, thank you very much. We are not left with much time. Just one minute, according to my watch. Uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, like to extend our very warm uh, gratefulness to all the panelists and to all the uh, the, the people who, who presented here and uh, to who participated. I thought it was a wonderful uh, panel, but uh, I would, I mean, once you pick up China issue, then of course you can go on and on. So maybe some other time, some other occasion, we will definitely have a, a session of India, Nepal, China, uh, which ranges back to the time when Nepal thought it was a yam between two boulders. Uh, but our experience says that Nepal has done a great job of being uh, in between these two giants and has uh, done the, the best uh, and has acted in its best interest. So over to you, Professor Rupadhe. Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm expressionless. And uh, to, to say that uh, thank you so much to each one of you. And thanks from heart, not just a formality 
for joining this uh, very wonderful conversation. And I hope we will get more opportunities to do it at the Center for Peace and Development and also along with our friends in Nepal. One thing which I would just uh, say before we close that uh, what uh, Dr. Jaiswal needs and uh, is doing is to, you know, facilitating mingling as we call it, bringing people together around range of themes, around every fortnight, every month. And in our own peace research, we say that this mingling or coming together and dialogue, if you want, dialogue is a more recent word. I think that is the key for a better uh, imagination. It's a better imagination for the future world order, which is what the theme of this particular uh, webinar has been. So all very best, Dr. Jaiswal, his wonderful team, Nimesh, and so many people who are organizing. One thing I'll compliment, I think this is, you are a trendsetter in South Asia. So please carry on, keep it up, and we will always be there whenever you want us. And to all my wonderful uh, uh, panelists, uh, thank you so much. Keep in touch and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure uh, being part of this illustrious uh, panel under your tutelage. Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much.